Please welcome to the TEDxSF stage, David Bolinsky. Hello. When I was 10 years old, I had the great privilege to go with my family to the caves of Lascaux in southern France. Had a chance to see the amazing paintings that were created by our Paleolithic cousins, these hunter-gatherers, this clan of ancients, had the foresight to think about how the animals they lived among and depended upon moved, how they threatened, how they did all of their things. And, and one of the things that amazed me about that is that these people who had heretofore had only technology that consisted of hand-cut obsidian tools were able to conceive of visual communication. These people were able to think about the use of contour and composition and color using a palette of ash and charcoal and metallic oxides to create beautiful portraits of animals among whom they lived and depended. In addition, these people were able to conceptualize not just the animals themselves, but here, as in this picture from the Chauvet Pont d'Arc in southern France, a 30,000-year-old painting, it shows a rhinoceros in motion. It shows that these people had the concept of being able to depict not only realistic creatures, but to depict how they moved in a way that froze their motion that froze their motion in a way that, that takes my breath away and I think tickles in my neurons the same kind of awe and wonder that it tickled in those people so many years ago. And it, it impressed me so very much that I really wanted to think about how I could live my life depicting things that gave me awe and wonder. So I became, over the years, uh, interested in illustration interested in science, eventually got myself a degree in medical illustration. Uh, follow our, following here are a few illustrations that I did when I was a senior medical illustrator at Yale Medical School, where I was scribing on paper, pen and ink, dipped in, a, in an ink well, on paper uh, using lines uh, similar to what my forebears did, our cousins in those flinty caves so very long ago. But the static images, as beautiful as they were, never satisfied me. And I really wanted to make movement. I really wanted to do some animation. And when I was uh, 16 years old, I read a book by Robert Heinlein, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, that introduced me to the concept that someday I might be able to use computers to do my animations. I had been doing flipbook animations since I saw Fantasia at four years old. My dad, the sculptor, Joe Bolinsky, helped me figure that out. And so one day when I was at Yale, I discovered that there was a company that had come up with a, a computer system that would allow me to begin to do what I wanted to do uh, with my illustration, but in color and in motion. And so uh, unable to convince the people at Yale that uh, there was room indeed for cartoons in medicine, I left Yale and started a, uh, the first digital medical animation company in the world and decided to embark on doing animation. And I did that for quite a long time uh, until I got an incredible opportunity back in 2005. I got a phone call from Rob Liu at Harvard asking me if I would embark on a little adventure with him to see if we could change undergraduate med uh, education in molecular and cellular biology. So we embarked on a project that many of you may have heard of called The Inner Life of the Cell, where we used cinematic, uh, complex visualizations and complex science to give students a sense of the vastness and complexity of a cell which had never been shown before, which was using a whole new visual vocabulary. So in a sense, by going into the computer animation world, I was uh, doing an homage to our ancient cousins, my grotto, was my studio, my hearth was my monitor, and the tools that I had to use and scrape up from various other disciplines uh, became uh, my palette. The thing that was interesting about the many years of animation that I did for clients before Rob Liu called me was that it was assumed that students and people who were naive to a given subject wanted simplicity. They needed simplicity in order to understand the subject. And what Rob gave me the insight about was that you could actually uh, respect the intelligence 
imagination drive of these students and gives them something much, much more complex and much more useful and much more inspiring. And so we came up with these animation series that, uh, that indeed uh, accomplished that. And one of the things that was most interesting to me wasn't just that we uh, accomplished the, the goal of having the students at Harvard score 100% on the tests where our animations were, uh, were uh, shown uh, compared to the control students, which only got about 70% on the test. But we also opened up a new way of thinking about how to teach science. Now, I had always wanted to make a splash in education where a lot of kids would get to learn science. And we've been talking today all about the, uh, the worldwide need for education in one thing or another uh, having to do with health. And it's, uh, it's been important to me to think about how we get a basic science education to as many of the hundreds of millions of kids around the world as possible. And the way to do that is by using uh, these sorts of devices. Now, you guys have been the pioneers of bleeding edge technology, buying your fondle slabs at very high prices in a sense, uh, being investors in the technology that eventually will trickle down as the, uh, the uh, tablet that Daniel showed you. And these tablets will, with Moore's Law, become less and less and less expensive. And the, uh, the uh, ability to have them in the hands of more and more students is upon us. Uh, so I started a new company uh, called Immersion Learning Company. The Immersion Learning Company is a new company that my partner Monty, and I, Monty Stettin and I started, uh, which is going to address the issue of international learning of science, the teaching of science to as many students as possible, using the kinds of aesthetics and the kinds of uh, scientific uh, uh, vocabulary creation that we pioneered with Harvard. And uh, we've just uh, established a partnership with uh, Quinnipiac University's new medical school, the Frank H. Netter Medical School. Uh, interestingly, it's the uh, first medical school named after a medical illustrator. And at 17 years old, it was Frank Netter's artwork that inspired me to go into medical illustration. So these are some early sketches of a project we're working on right now on platelets and blood clotting. And uh, this is going to be a series of interactive iPad apps for medical students, nursing students, and allied, allied health students. Uh, this is another project that we're working on on cell biology for elementary and middle school students. So we're trying to look at how we can take the kinds of work that we did for the elite students of the world and bring the same quality down to as many students as we can possibly uh, bring into, into this environment uh, using the long tail where the Moore's Law uh, 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 formula fits making the devices cheaper and ever more available and so a longer list of, of, uh, of students can buy these things at ever cheaper prices. Uh, this is a sample of how we might interactively uh, look into this uh, biology app. And next, I want to show you a uh, sample app that we've created that shows a little bit more uh, elaborate. Uh, this is a, a sample chapter on, uh, on cord blood stem cells. And as you can see, it's uh, operable by your finger. You've got an interactive table of contents that allows you to scan through just like a normal book. You've got your text, you've got your pictures. And uh, unlike the pictures of a normal book, you can uh, create an animation.
you can scrub through the animation to various parts and see things over and over again. They can have labels, they can have uh, different voiceovers in different languages, and it's really quite flexible because with this kind of thing, you can have different levels of audience understand the material from, uh, from different levels of, of understanding of the vocabulary and previous exposure. Pages can be as long as you want. They can scroll uh, much longer than a single page. And of course, uh, everything here uh, is, of course, animated. You can have interviews with scientists, you can have real data, you can have all sorts of stuff. Anything you can touch, you can turn into an interactive event. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can look at the material, you can uh, tap on things and then go through different layers. I could tap on the lungs, go down into the lungs, look at normal anatomy, look at pathological anatomy, get text in, uh, and uh, links, and really have as deep an environment as a student wants to go through, uh, totally up to, the, up to the student. And then, of course, there can be a place in the, in the book where you can scan through a lot of other related images and pick out anything that you have an interest in and go deeper to your heart's content. In this kind of an environment, in a school device, the teacher can understand and, uh, intimately how long you've spent on each piece. They can understand what you've understood. They can know where you, the gaps are, and they can hone in on a per-student basis exactly where you need help without wasting time on the lowest common denominator teaching. So this is the kind of thing that we hope will uh, spur a lot of uh, interest, in, interest worldwide, a lot of learning. We hope to be able to get these kinds of devices, these kinds of teaching tools eventually into the hands of two to three hundred million students around the world. And we hope that future historians will look back on the visual vocabulary that we've been creating and think about those in terms of how we've responded to the ancient cave paintings and think about us in the same way as kin. Thank you very much.